welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Everybody's probably all over the world, so whatever time zone you may in, welcome. Um, in uh, the sunny Southern California wine country of Temecula, it is 3, <coughs> 12, uh, 18, a little bit after noon time here on the 6th of April. Welcome everybody to why traders that use the market profile and footprint charts are printing money. I know that sounds like a uh, crazy title, but it's true. <laughs> So for those of you that have seen me before, um, I put up a lot of videos on YouTube. I've got quite a large following uh, in terms of views. And I really only focus on two themes. And the first theme is auction market theory, um, which is essentially just the large macro scale framing uh, of the auctioning process that takes place. Um, and I also focus on, and which is a, a very macro view, uh, I, is more of like the where of what's going on. And then I take the opposite side of that focus all the way down to the most micro level of execution, and that is order flow using either the footprint, which is the market delta only um, chart, or a plug-in to Ninja Trader called Jigsaw, which is Peter Davies' company in Australia. So those two tools essentially don't look the same, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, most important what they do, and that's putting the actual volume in its aggregate, what executes at each particular price point. In this case, we'll be taking a look at the ES S&P 500 mini contract. I'm also going to be showing you guys some live of what took place today because <clears throat> theory is important. I think understanding is important, but at the end of the day, the practical implementation of how you can use this to get your arms around or frame the auctioning process that's taking place in whatever market you're trading. So know that with the market fest, there's been a number of folks today that have presented um, that have used Ninja Trader. So I'm going to be showing a little bit of market delta it may seem foreign to some of you. Um, it is a phenomenal software package. I do not work for, nor do I get compensated <laughs> by market delta. Trevor Hartnett is a friend. Um, I am a preferred educational partner there, but I'm not here pitching anything. So just a little bit on who am I and know that, um, some of you may know who I am. We got a few questions via email before the webinar today. But this is our website, cefxestrader.com. If you want to read a bio on the home page, just scroll down a little bit. You can go to my bio. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, let me just real briefly, while we're down at the bottom here, go through the disclaimer. Um, futures trading can really result in, in a risk of loss and commodities, and it can be substantial. And, you know, therefore you should carefully consider whether such trading is suitable for you in light of your financial condition. Now, there's a lot of other stuff. You're welcome to click on this page and read the disclosure and disclaimer. Um, the key thing really here is, guys, is I've seen a lot of students that before they joined our firm and started taking our courses, they've really blown out a lot of futures accounts. And I, I hate seeing that in students. So please understand the risks that are involved and trade in the simulator, especially if you have a Ninja Trader as an example, have an excellent simulator, before you actually start trading real capital. Don't trade any money you need for mortgage payments, car payments, and food, children, all that fun stuff. So now that the attorneys are happy, let me jump back a little bit. Uh, and the other important thing is that we're, we're going to touch on these two topics. We're going to glaze over them. And an hour and 15 minutes, quite frankly, is not enough time to thoroughly teach both these concepts. I'm going to teach you what the most important high-level parts of them are. But I think it's critical that if you go to my YouTube channel, and this is the view that I see, but we have a lot of views on YouTube. And if you go to the videos list, Keep in mind you're looking at this from my view standpoint, but you go to the views list, you can see all different kinds of videos that go through and talk a lot about the different concepts in a much broader um, perspective. So the I get asked the question a lot, you know, why do I do this? And really I think that 
what really surprised me is when I started trading for Fidelity towards the end of my trading career, moving into the analysis of my career with the firm, I got the opportunity to trade a lot of the executives accounts. And I traded a number of large executives, primarily Peter Lynch's personal trust account. And I was just shocked as to how portfolio managers and sort of the inside Wall Street guys um, acted completely different than what they were taught, what was taught to clients. And this really opened my eyes back up as a young trader in 1997 and 98, working on Fidelity Spartan Options desk. So I've really thought that, you know, the, even though I've raised lots of money for lots of different firms, and quite frankly, I got sick of just making other firms wealthy, and I decided to set up my own investment advisory firm. Um, one thing I did learn that was very apparent in the career through many of these different types of firms is that true alpha, the generation of excess return over a particular benchmark, is critical in the growth of a client's account or the growth of a trader's account. And too much of the industry has really, in effect, brainwashed most of this planet into thinking that, yes, it's important to be diversified and think long term and have lots of different asset class exposure to different sectors as well as value versus growth in the equities department. I really think that it's important to recognize that things are going to get ugly in, for example, equities land in 2008. So a lot of the concepts that I'm going to be teaching you today can be applied to anything that has a market for it, whether it be real estate, whether it be Apple computer, okay? You can put a frame around the auctioning process of a particular stock, a bond, a index, a currency pair, whether it's something that's traded as an actual pair in Forex or as a, um, you know, in a particular currency traded on the CME as an example, like 6E, 6B. I heard some of the previous questions surrounding that. So you can use this tool for gold, you can use it for oil, because this tool both measures and frames the time spent building out as well as the volume. Okay. So what I would encourage you guys to do is just sort of a housekeeping measure. If you have any questions surrounding any of this, um, you know, just let me know, type it up and I'll try and answer the questions towards the end take some extra time. I got about 16 slides to go through and probably take about 20 minutes to do that. And then we'll jump into explaining how this looks from the standpoint of the software. So I'll drag both of the profile charts and the footprint chart into the screen. So here's my goal today. So as far as the overview, we want to go through what market profile and footprint charts are. Again, keep in mind there's tons of videos out there that, especially on YouTube, of all kinds of different types of educators teaching this, especially market delta zone videos, which are very good. Um, so I would encourage you is if you don't feel like you've gained a, a, a solid grasp around this, um, you know, do check out some of the other videos you could search for them. So what is market profile? What's a footprint chart? Why is it important to understand how it tracks order flow? You need to do this because it really gives a trader an edge. I mean, really, the key thing is if you have a statistical edge in trading, um, that is really everything. <laughs> um, because if you have the ability through the software to understand the auctioning process, be able to put together some hypotheticals of what could take place based upon, based upon what did take place, um, that gives you an edge, and that really is the bottom line. So know that I, I don't discount, even though I often joke in videos about indicators and, you know, MACDs and this and that, and DeMarc and um, all kinds of different types of indicators. I think they're all important, but if one doesn't understand the big picture of what's going on in the auctioning process, are we on a trend day up? Are we essentially bursting out of a particular balance area? Are we continuing to move up? Are we facilitating trade within a particular range? all important things that mark a profile, once you grasp the concept um, at both the macro and micro levels, 
can teach you as far as having a ton of confidence in knowing what's going on in the market. So we'll go through some examples. Um, I took out the September 2015, but I'll go through what took place in January. We can scroll back um, and take a look at that. So that's the only difference that I've decided to change up versus September 15th. So really the key thing is while we're looking at the footprint chart, the goal is while observing the footprints to determine whether trading activity is drying up, being facilitated, or increasing in pace at one form of price extreme or another, okay? And you'll see the bonus today. I've decided to overlay the volume imbalance indicator on top of it, which gives us in a different coloration, I'll show that, um, it's an algorithmic view of buy versus sell. So the number three is <clears throat> um, a bonus as well. It's the seven steps to consistent profitability. And I'll go through that, which is essentially right here. And the steps to consistent profitability are, are really key. But my hope is through this webinar, and if you need to replay it several times, um, is you want to be able to understand context because the context of what's going on I know a lot I get a lot of questions from students what's context Steve context is just you knowing what's going on you know are we balancing have we been balancing for three or four days is statistically those three or four days the max that we've balanced before we've broken out to a higher lower area of potentially balancing or trend up or down that's understanding in its most broad sense context. So without further ado, let's go into some market profile fun stuff. So I'll let you guys read this and take a quick sip of water here, but really the value area is a primary component um, and it's really what we're looking for when we see the value. Now is that's value based upon 70% uh, of either the time or the volume in a given period. So what you're going to see in my chart is a session two, uh, which is essentially the futures markets, 9.15 a.m. Eastern time, uh, or 9.30 a.m. Eastern time to 4.15 a.m. Uh, p.m. And I can also jump back and show you the Globex period as well. So it's just understanding that the objective is to show traders where value is being established and provide low risk high reward trading areas based upon some simple rules and strategies. So uh, one of the most common uses of the value area is to relate the current day's trading activity to the previous day's value area. Now, the, the caveat there is that although that's important, I also think it's important to compare today's activity, or even the overnight, to the previous five days. So a lot of students will say, well, Steve, you keep you know, telling us repeat and replay the profiles so that we can see how trade played out over a period of time. You always go back five days. I go back actually three weeks, but you wanna start looking at a smaller period of time and replay the profile, which is one of the features of Market Delta and Linsoft, which is their sister company, um, of being able to replay the profile. And it, it, it gives you a tremendous amount of insight into what the market did. So the best thing about the value area is the bell-shaped curve. And I'll get into that on slide number six of showing different scenarios. Because really the key thing is you're either going to bounce between value area, high and low, right? Or you're going to break out and fake outs possibly above it, thus bouncing back into value or you're going to break out a value above, come back, touch the top of it, and potentially run, kind of like today as an example. Notice we based, we had an open, um, an opening print that took place. We auctioned down to the 35 area uh, and had what at least I would call an open rejection reverse, and that led into a trend day up in the market. It broke out of value. So I'll go ahead and show you that on all the charts, but. Really the key thing, just getting back to the slide, um, is that the, all market activity occurs within the framework of the auction process. 
So as price moves up, it brings in more buying, or as price moves down, it brings in more selling. So the market options up, auctions up essentially till there's no more buyers, and then it reverses and moves down until there are no more sellers. So the end of an up auction essentially is the beginning of a down, not necessarily down a lot, it could certainly bounce around um, and a very tight range like we saw today that I'll show you. So the, the first question I typically get when we're looking at this is, um, you know, what are the most important things to take away from just a broad macro sense of market profile? And while I'm going into the difference between response of selling, <clears throat> both up and down and initiative selling versus responsive buying and just the activity, which is slide five here, is you got to understand that this in and of itself market profile is sort of like its own little universe of a tool. It's much different uh, as an actual tool than any other indicator out there, in my opinion, uh, because it teaches you from a very broad sense instead of just looking at, you know, 30 days of you know 240 minute candles or daily candles or weekly or whatever you can sort of put them all into perspective as far as how each of those candles relates to the previous grouping of whatever the number is you know was there a, a tremendous amount of balancing uh, at the or I should say underneath the 260 area which is where we've been hovering under um, on the ES uh, ever since the um, fall apart in January in the um, rip back up to the area that we've had you know the 240 to 260 area has really been just an absolute line in the sand over quite a long period of time as far as the s p 500 contract why is that it's because it's where the vast majority of points of control in the market profile chart are over huge chunks of period of time so to illustrate that um, if i forget remind me guys i'll show you the monthly profile as well so, but the key thing to understanding responsive selling, and there's really little scenarios that could be classified as responsive, but um, responsive and whether it's responsive selling or responsive buying, you know, really the key thing is, is that the market will open within the value area, make an attempt to trade above it, and sellers enter the market and auction price back into the value area. Okay, so essentially responsive selling is keeping it tighter, keeping it within the range or the balance area that it's in. Um, you know, the strategy works well in, in, in what they call bracketing, but I just call it a, a balance area, okay? The second scenario is essentially the opposite of that, okay? Where the market opens above the value area and sellers immediately start entering into the market. This will be witnessed by prices moving lower right from the open. So we had the opposite of that today. So the market auctioned down to um, <clears throat> yesterday's value area low and actually dropped about three and a half points below that. We found responsive buying kept us back into the value area that we pumped back up into. So knowing that gives a tremendous amount, and, and don't worry about that 80% rule, it only happens about 60% of the time. <laughs> so and then the, the same thing with, with out of balance. Um, the responsive is important to recognize because if you have, if you really think of it, like as today's an example, I kind of felt we'd be um, in a, a responsive sort of balancing type of market, you know, range bound, if you will, albeit the ranges today were a bit broader. Um, I thought we'd be range bound and um, not initiative. You know, the, the, the most important concept that can keep traders um, on the right side of the market, especially if you're a trend trader, you're looking to trade the pullbacks, um, is the initiative selling. And this is one of the most important concepts in market profile, because quite frankly, if you can spot any type of initiative selling or buying, you know that the other time frame players in the market are active. And what I mean by other time frame players, um, and you can take a look at all the, the different Fed meetings that we had if you want to see an example of when big other time frame players stepped into the market. Um, 
was right after a lot of the Fed announcements we've had this year and subsequent news and press release meetings um, and notes. So <clears throat> we had a lot of initiative buying, at least we have after the big sell-off in January. So the this is important because if you can <clears throat> comfortably, you know, this is a business of ambiguity, right? You're never really going to have the, the perfect ring the bell at the top or the bottom in terms of getting long or short. It is a business of <clears throat> judgment. And um, this is why I use a profile a lot because it helps me make much better judgments about where the market is headed. So that's initiative selling. And just jump back in case. And by the way, guys, if you want um, at the end the, on those last slides, my email address, uh, because some of this can be a confusing topic, uh, I will typically recommend if you guys genuinely want to, to sort of dive into it further, send me an email and ask me for the, the PDF of these slides. I'll email them to you. Let me just jump back here. So if you're looking just at a time-based profile, let me drag that in here right now. <clears throat> Tell you what, before I get into the scenarios here, let me just pull the profile in. Looks like it's showing up good. Okay, so I'm gonna expand this out and we're just gonna take a look. Let's see if I can adjust this around, drop it up. Okay, so essentially we're looking at today, and you can see I'm circling this. Um, Oftentimes, don't like to grab the markers because it sort of has to throw my drawing off here. But let me see if I can grab a marker. So this is today's profile. You can see it's a very elongated profile. We had a large range today. We also had <clears throat> um, a number of interesting things happen. So the, the timing of this webinar, I think, is pretty cool because I can show lots of different nuances that took place that really could help one's trading out. So if you're not familiar and you've never seen a market profile chart before, and I'll just, let me just break this out. Okay, we're starting off with an opening print here at 2038. Each of these, what they call brackets, and there's different terms for them, are essentially 30 minute candles. So this is the first 30 minute candle. This is a session two of the ES S&P 500 E mini contract. We're looking at the 930 New York Eastern time open right here, this entire D bracket, okay? Um, each of these letters is called a time price opportunity. It's really nothing more than an alphabetic way to show a, a that it traded at each price. But <clears throat> E bracket, which is the next half an hour, each of these have an opening print, which is designated by the zero here. And the opening print is just that. It's the first next half an hour's opening print. So the red area which is sort of flanking the backside of this D bracket. This is the initial balance. And you know, don't pay as much attention to the previous day, just focus on the profile that I circled, which is today's RTH trading. The value area is represented by the magenta, the pink line, see how it sort of brackets backwards. Whereas the overlapping brown line is the volume area also represented by the pink in the background, okay? There's many different ways you can set up these market profile charts, colors, all kinds of stuff. What is generally agreed upon, almost like a generally accepted accounting principles type thing, is that value area represents 70% of either where the volume or the time traded in that period. So as you can see, before we rip past 2042 on what looked like to me some other time frame activity turned out to just be a short squeeze. Um, the volume and the value area was 
primarily compressed down here at the bottom. Then we broke out, we formed a single, which I'll get into in a bit, which is this black line right here. And we've begun to trade up into this area. Now I split the charts out because it's easier to see for someone that has not seen this before. For those of you that have been through this time and time again, or maybe market profile experts, um, you know, bear with me here. Maybe there's a couple of nuggets you'll be able to pull out of this, this discussion. But I like to both have each bracket is a different color. That allows me to see their interrelationships much faster. I like to have the singles be a single black line. I prefer the value area to under or, or to overlap the volume area. Because primarily I'm looking at this chart from the standpoint of a time that we've spent in these areas. I'm not as concerned about the volume. Although it is overlaid and I can see where both at 2, uh, 2051 and 2051 and a quarter, I can see where both of those areas are the points of control. And really a point of control is nothing more than a center point of where the highest amount of each has traded. So as we continue to trade through the day, these brackets will jump around um, to different areas. How these brackets move around and the relationship between where they were to where they are now is also a big tell into what's going on in the auction process in that particular day, okay? So whether you're looking at this in terms of the ES contract, whether you're looking at this in terms of, you know, oil, gold, you know, the 6E, which is the <clears throat> CME, uh, Forex, US, Euro, or you're looking at the 6B, which is the, you know, the yen, I mean, whatever you're looking at, the key thing is, is that you may not have the volume aggregated, especially in Paris Forex land, because it's not aggregated volume. And that's one reason I prefer to trade the futures markets on the CME or NYMEX, uh, because those, you can get uh, an aggregated volume and it's not a fragmented, uh, but you can get the time side using the other uh, spot Forex. So I know that you can use it for that. So as the market opened up in the sort of light of the response of selling versus buying versus initiative buying versus selling, um, know that it appeared that even when we got up to this point, we formed a single, um, which is nothing more than the potential, not necessarily the guarantee that other time frame players are coming into the market. Um, we broke above that um, and we formed what's called a zipper. And this F bracket here is a zipper. And oftentimes the zipper and any corresponding brackets that trade back down against it or bottoms of candles that come back down against this area, um, we in many cases can have what's called missing notches. All these different concepts um, and that are not meant to confuse you. It's just to mean that it gives you a, 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 just a general overview of all the stuff that you can glean from being able to accurately read the auctioning process. So essentially we opened up, auctioned both up and down. It was almost an open auction in range type of opening, which turned into a rejection reverse. Now I break from a lot of other educators in that I actually use two types of opening. Um, one of them is for the first hour and the other one is for the next hour. Okay, so it's almost like a two complete um, different opinions of what took place in D and E bracket. And then I will reset that or sort of keep my eye on alert for a potential. So a lot of people that use conventional market profile would said, okay, well, we opened up auction all the way up to 2041.75 and down to 2035. Um, well, that's our, that's our range. It's the initial balance. It's the first hour of trade. Okay. And the yellow is really just a mathematical computation of the first hour's initial balance range, highlighted in red, times one and a half. The green area is times two, okay? I don't use the yellow and green areas to trade from. I know some educators in rooms do. I don't think they're that dependable. Now, that's just maybe an overview of what takes place as far as how it builds out and what the brackets look like. And, um, you know, you can use X's and O's. I choose to use the alphabet um, either way because it's easier to go back and say, well, D bracket versus just a whole stack of X's and O's. Um, so you can pinpoint that. 
So when you're good at market profile, most will unsplit the charts back and they'll, they begin to replay the week. And that's what you're seeing here. You can choose a date. Um, you can stop the replay or just kill it and the market will come back. So with replays, <clears throat> I always recommend when you're going through and preparing for the week is that you replay the market from a particular date, um, at least the last five days, and you, and you can speed it up as I have running here, but I know this may not be coming through quite as fast. Um, but the cool thing is, is that it shows you exactly what the market date is, a whole replay, and you can see the interrelationships between where these points controls are bouncing around and also the value area. Okay. And once you've watched enough of these replays, you've gone through the concepts. And keep in mind, I know I haven't mentioned um, Jim Dalton's books, uh, but he's written two really good ones. Uh, one's called Markets and Profile, which is the 97 version. Um, and the other one is Mind Over Markets, which is the original book. These books are kind of costly because some of them are out of print. I think they're about seven or 80 bucks each. Um, our students get these books for free in PDF form. Um, but the, the reason I don't talk too much about um, Dalton's books is because some of, his, some of the stuff's changed. And, you know, how it's laid out in the first couple of chapters, I always recommend reading. But a lot has changed in the perception of the auctioning process. I mean, the core of what I've talked about has been known for three decades now since the early 80s when J. Peter Stettelmeyer developed uh, for the Chicago Board of Trade auction market theory using market profile. Um, but Dalton has done a fantastic job over the last number of decades of being one of the initial lead educators of this. So some of his stuff is really good. It's just that the half of those, the back half of those books, you know, they'll just bore you to death. So I think the best thing is to go in, <clears throat> watch a number of videos, or if you're going to um, decide to purchase a course from an educator, you know, best to get into, um, you know, the details of always split your charts out at the beginning so you can see the interrelationships of each bracket to each other. So you think if I covered everything, by the way, the one question, the gold area is just the value area as well. Okay. So it's just, it just shows where the value area is. We're building the chart out here. Um, and I just want you guys to see a little bit of how the replay works. So, but you can use this. It doesn't have to be on the ES. I mean, we could take a look at the NQ. This is a NASDAQ. Here's what took place in the NASDAQ, you know. And notice a fairly similar type of profile today. We opened up, bounced around with a tight in this particular case, uh, almost a one and a half hour balance area at the bottom, broke out. Notice we formed a single in the NQs as well, continued to rip up, formed the first of three zippers. So this particular profile is called a double, this one, this particular one is, called a triple distribution trend day up, okay? There's different types of day profiles. There's different types of openings. Each and the understanding of all of those, which I'm not gonna cover, I don't have the time today, will give you an understanding of whether or not other time frame players are coming into the market or not. And it certainly appears if you look at the NQs, notice we went all the way up to the top of the range of the entire balance range that we've had for over six days since we ripped up off of that Fed news. So you can see here on the 29th, um, this is a great example of, <clears throat> I mean, let's face it, it was the end of the quarter, some window dressing going on here with fund managers, but the market took off. And this was an other time frame player stepping in to levitate the markets. This happened in, in many international broad-based indexes, but as we're looking at the NQs here, um, once we got in, and let me just grab the drawing tool for this, we formed up here what's called a balance area, okay? So you can actually take the profile, or if you use composites, which I'll show you in a bit, uh, you can take the profile and you can 
condense this such you put all five days together or all 10 days or a month and there's a lot of information that can be gleaned from what I like to call a composite of a period of time it'll tell you where the majority of the value area highs and lows maybe this was the value area high for the particular group maybe this was the value area low so if you're a range trader as many of our students are taught in the very beginning with our course we want you to trade the extreme outs only in the beginning. These are the areas to take the longs and the shorts, okay? Extreme outs, because we know that we've ripped up into this. We spent, what do we got? One, two, three, four, five, six days balancing. There's pretty good chance, especially since that's a, a, a pretty good balance, there's a pretty good chance that we're gonna break out of this balance either later this week or possibly sometime in the early next week. So understanding how balance areas work or a range of time and volume in relation to how long that time and volume is spent in that particular balance area can also tell you a ton of information. So <clears throat> if it seems like I'm jumping around, I mean, I kind of am, but I think that the, the understanding of how markets work from you know literally just like looking through a frame um, and being able to understand that from a broad macro perspective there's all kinds of different types of tidbits we can take from that so if I erase that this question should be asked well you know what are those tidbits let's take a look by the way if you guys have any questions just type them in I'll, I'll get them answered towards the end all right <clears throat> we'll go into the footprint after this so coming into the end of March, we had, um, at least what appears without me making the thing so small you can't see it, a balance area of approximately 72 um, to about 38. So we had <clears throat> essentially about 60 points of NQ range uh, that we were balancing around. Notice that each day from the 17th to the 18th to the 21st, which was the Monday, um, we had a higher value area, almost like a step up, a almost every day higher volume, or that's the brown line, the volume point of control. So essentially we're building value higher. This is called time framing, and markets will move in, in this particular case, we were one time framing up. I'm just looking at three days here for the ease of education. We could have been one time framing up for um, many other days. The, the time framing concept um, is important as well because the markets can only time frame in one direction, you know, higher lows each day, higher highs. They can only one time frame for a finite period of time. So if you're coming in an example, and these statistics always change, but let's say statistically, once you hit five days of one time framing up, um, you're due for a bounce, okay? Well, armed with that knowledge or those statistics, um, that gives me an edge to know that, hey, maybe we've stopped one time framing up. So now maybe with the top of the range, if we get back up towards the extremes, I can take a shot at some shorts. Conversely, the bottom of the range, I can take advantage of maybe some longs. You know, what this does, and I understand these are trades that take more patience because they're extreme outs, um, but what this does is this helps an early trader gain confidence in really trading at, at, at extreme levels of, of the range. And, you know, we do not teach our students to trade the chop. This is not a methodology of our soup to nuts course. Um, it's not a methodology to teach someone scalp. Now, certainly when you become really good at using the footprint, which I'm showing next, um, you certainly can scalp. But this, in its just macro sense, is the where to trade or where the market is moving around to. It's not the when, okay? So let me just jump back into the slides because I think this one is important. Keeping an eye on time here. We're about 45 minutes in so far. So scenario one, 
market opens above the value area and is able to hold the value area high on subsequent tests back down, okay? It's a strong bullish signal. Doesn't necessarily mean other time frame players are coming in though. So if the market begins to trade within the value area and volume picks up, it would be recommended to exit long positions. So essentially you're trying to trade off a bounce off the value area high, okay? Common scenario. Two, when a market opens above the value area but then begins to trade for two consecutive brackets back inside the value area, and there's a strong tendency to rotate all the way through the value area and test the value area low. This is what's called the 80% rule, but actually only works about 60% of the time. So, and, but it's possible, I and mean, we, we pretty much had that today, right? So we got above yesterday's value and just tried to rip back up, even formed a single, um, you know, to show the strength of, of that move up. Now, just because we formed a couple of singles today and we went up and we had a number of areas of distribution, which is the, hence the, the day type today, which is a triple distribution trend day up, um, doesn't mean that other time frame players stepped in the market. Although it's, it has been apparent to me that over the last three days, four, um, including the end of March is typically window dressing. Other time frame players are typically more active towards the end of a quarter in the beginning. So no surprise that we've sporadically seen that type of um, activity. So <clears throat> the scenario three, when a market opens below the value area, then begins to trade for two consecutive brackets back inside the value area. There's a strong tendency to rotate all the way through the value area and test the value area high, okay? Important. All of these carry equal weights and importance, and it is critical that one's able to recognize these. Um, you may not be able to foretell these types of scenarios playing out, um, but you can certainly start by being able to see them um, in the formation, hence the replay I would show an example of. So scenario four is when the market opens below the value area and is able to hold the value area low on subsequent tests, it's a strong bearish signal. Again, just the opposite of <coughs> um, scenario one. So scenario five is when the market opens within value and it's showing signs of a balanced market, right? Rotational to the top and bottom of value areas. It's trading from a responsive versus an initiative mind frame. So it's very easy to short the tops and bottoms of the value area. This becomes more of a, a, a multiple trade day. This happens more times generally in the markets. I say generally, I mean yes, S&P contract, than in the other scenarios. Most of the time, although you'd look back, you know, the last six plus years and the events surrounding one time framing up or down or is a greater percentage, it still doesn't overlap the fact we spend most of the time balancing within a particular area. So those are the five scenarios, touched a little on that, uh, the overview. So you may not have a full grasp of initiative versus responsive, just understand that initiative is the big one. Somebody's initiating something outside of the box, okay? versus just responding to or trying to push us back down inside. You know, the, the problem is, is that for the new market profile trader learning the tool, it is difficult to discern whether or not a breakout above a particular group of value areas, you know, let's say recently make it up value area in the ES, bottom was 2035, right? And the top was 2045 over the last four days, essentially a 10 point balance area. We decided to, you know, spend three days balancing and then we broke out. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean there's always other time frame player. It could be just a short squeeze. So the, um, you know, just understand the relationships to that. All right, let's get into the footprint. Um, this is about the exact opposite as I've been talking because <laughs> now we're going to just absolutely microscope all the way down to the execution level in the market. Okay. 
So um, the benefits of a bid ask footprint uh, is tracking order flow. Okay. The key thing is that the foot shows where price has executed and where trade has taken place at its most aggressive level. Why do I say aggressive? Aggressive meaning that we're not watching a time in the sales screen that's unfiltered with just lots of one lot trades ripping through it faster than we can see. We're actually seeing an aggregate of where the volume fills at a particular price point uh, on bid versus offer. So executing with greater precision, I guess that goes without saying, gaining confidence. Um, what I love about this is filters the noise. So you can actually filter out the one lots, but even though you're not filtering it, it still is aggregating it. So you don't, it, you don't really care as much about how many one lots went through. What you can do with the footprint is you can filter out the large contracts to trade. And with the order and balance algo that I'll show, you can also see the relationships between what executes on bid versus offer, and that can bring some improved transparency, which ultimately leads to better trades. So I <clears throat> uh, highly suggest everybody read this. <laughs> so we feel that order flow analysis is the missing link for many traders. It refers to how orders are coming into the market, how they're being filled, whether executing the offer or on the bid, it is the dual auction at its most micro level. So assessing order flow in real time can tell the traders how the trade is being facilitated in any direction. Obviously a key concept in auction market theory, but now it's being applied to the actual order flow patterns. So as the revealed by the footprint, we'll be looking not at traditional price patterns, rather at time and sales patterns. So traditional TNS window data simply just moves too fast to comprehend, and then in a flash, the data scrolled by and out of sight. Whereas the footprint diverges radically from traditional price patterns and or indicator-based analysis, and no attempt is made to oversimplify or undersimplify. So the footprint is not a red light, green light type of system. Instead, it's really the insight gleaned from the deep and experienced comprehension of the footprint. It allows the trader to integrate this data along with current market context and sound market logic. So in general, market profile, support and resistance analysis, trend lines, all the other macro type big picture technical analysis provides the where to trade, the footprint excels in showing when. I kind of like to call it my fine tuner, okay? So, it contains all the price and volume data organized, just like talked about, uncover patterns, um, see when to buy and sell, <clears throat> gauge the tendency of market continue in a given direction, which is what I'm going to spend most of my next mm, probably 10 minutes showing you. See how the buy and sell orders are impacting price. Um, so it really boils down to just having more confidence, which is really everything. So what's a footprint look like? Okay, this, let me just move this other screen over. <laughs> okay. This is the footprint chart of today. And I can make this really small so we can see. And keep in mind that this is not a regular candle chart. This is a point and figure chart. And this confuses a lot of people, but this is a five tick point and configure chart of today's trade. Okay, we're compressed all the way down. You can see how we've <clears throat> balanced for a little while and then we've um, just taken off back up again. And you know, if you if you bring this down tight enough, you can see where the triple distribution trend day up came from. Here's our first distribution down here. First distribution meaning trading balancing range. Second distribution right here. Third at the top, all the way to the end, okay? So just, but in its most micro level, this is what a footprint chart looks like. Bid versus offer, left versus right. What actually executes? 
everything highlighted in yellow, is the point of control for that particular bar or candle. The different colors at the top, like for instance, if you can see it, let me see if I can scroll on a little bit for you. The green versus the red, that's the order and balance algo taking place. It's showing where there is more than a four to one imbalance at either up or down. Okay. Now there's a lot of, I mean, we could talk for hours on this thing, but I want to teach you guys just generally why I think you should be interested in it a little bit how it works. And then obviously, uh, hopefully everybody will go out and seek out their own education on the tool um, or give us a call if you want to go through our course. But we teach the soup the nuts of how to use the footprint chart and how powerful it can be. So I'll go through if I have some time today in the footprint. Let me just drag this over and go back to that one slide because I have, using different dates in the past, I have the slides that represent all the different things that the footprint can teach you. So <clears throat> there's a lot of different things that a footprint can do, um, but essentially it makes it easy to compare subsequent movements in the same direction. So when a market makes a push that reveals less order flow in that direction, it can be a powerful reversal signal. Okay, so as you can see the second bar down here, 26 by zero, 47 by zero. This, not necessarily, but generally can be construed as a drying up of volume. Does that mean we're going to rip back up? No, just means that at that particular point, um, we've had a drying up of volume. So the lack of any new selling oftentimes will push price back up, just depends upon for how long and to what level um, and what price point higher. You can kind of see how you literally, if you were good enough for reading these, I hope that you could use the footprint in tandem with the market profile chart um, and just trade using those two tools. I have many friends as professional traders with funds in New York and LA, a couple of prop shop buddies that, that trade just using these tools. Now they understand price action, obviously how to read candles and all that fun stuff, but they just use these two tools. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we've had to dry up, we moved back up, okay, it's an example of one type of use of the footprint. Here's an example is it makes it easy to spot legitimate orders um, affecting the market, okay, so <clears throat> many times when you see anything by anything, instead of a zero by something or a something by zero, that tells you many times that that's an incomplete auction and that we will go back up there. So in this particular case, we zoomed all the way up through a couple of blocks of prices, stopped at the 60 by 1954, pulled back. Those understanding how the footprint works automatically are saying to themselves, there's a really good chance we're going back up there again to try and complete the auction. Sure enough, we rotated back up, completed it. So despite significant volume on the ask, <clears throat> orders to buy were unable to push past this level. This is due to the equal or greater number of limit orders to sell. Now remember this again, this is not just a, a flash of <clears throat> an order book. This is what executes. So these two footprint patterns confirmed this resistance levels and offered valid reasons to go short. This is an example of a reversal. Here's an example of another reversal using the order imbalance algo. Notice the no order flow went off the top, right? Plus two big sell side imbalances, far more than four to one, which is the minimum this algo needs to see in order to print a different color inside these boxes. <clears throat> so this was then notice we had a big flush. Now you notice another thing. We had a zero by something, right? But look what happened here. We had a 215 by 1017, probably hard to see because it's small, but just believe me when I say that it looked to appear that even though we had a flush, that there's maybe a chance we could go back up there because it was an unfinished auction. They don't all have to finish at zero by something in order to move to the next bracket. All it has to do is reverse five ticks in order for it to start to print a new bar, okay? And I'm 
one, one, in, one of the questions I just got via email is it doesn't really matter what time we're looking at or what contract. The, the thing that matters to be able to effectively use the footprint is on a liquid market. So whether you're using it for to trade, you know, an equity that's got volume or a particular futures contract that has aggregated volume, and those, in my opinion, are the most important things that need to exist first. This can't work, in my opinion, on spot forex because it's too fragmented. Plus, I don't trade forex anyway. So, um, and the reason is, is for many, uh, most of the United traders in the United States that are residents, the IRS has far more favorable tax treatment of trading futures, 60-40, um, than it does for trading Forex. <clears throat> so when we came back up here with the hint, if you will, of an incompleted auction, and look what the footprint did for us. It came flying back up to this area and it hit another much larger than four to one sell side of balance. Now, maybe in this particular example, it ripped up there so fast, you didn't have a chance to get on it. But the quick and larger volume, and keep in mind there's no POC in this older one because it wasn't offered back then, uh, but if you had a point of control in there for each bar, <clears throat> you could see how the point of control would, um, you know, where it'll stop a particular move and then reverse back down. So this is one. Here's another example. I mean, they can, we can go on and on and on with all this, but we're coming up against... Um, when I want to take questions here. So <clears throat> um, this is a great example of a huge exhaustion, okay? Now, we, in this particular case, and I don't show that at the beginning of this chart, but we had a, a really good move up from 1670 to 1680, just almost a rip. Um, it didn't look like at the time, this was another time frame move up, it looked like it was just a short squeeze, which, which I love, because that's when I will just laser focus in on the footprint looking for sell side and balances to hit, possibly take a short up against a, an important area where there's a lot of confluence like there was in 1683 at the time. So when we came up to this area, had one, two, three sell side and balances capping the tops of all of these candles. And then we had a big exhaustion rip. Look at that, zero by nine, six, zero twos is a big blast out. Now, does it mean we're going to drop down a bunch? No, but it's giving you more confidence in cutting through some of the ambiguity that's up here um, as far as the actual execution of orders. Next chart. I love this one uh, because <clears throat> we still don't have the, and, and I much prefer the point of controls, um, either in a line or a hollow shading or some sort of graphical format. Um, they didn't have to, they didn't offer that back then, but one thing to understand is that um, and this is quite a while ago, as you can tell by the price of the ES, but I just I love this example because it just shows that when you have huge volume take place, as we see bracketed in, in um, yellow here, that doesn't necessarily preclude some large rip take place, but it does indicate a lot of volume has stepped in um, and traded. So this would be a point of control if we were looking at the profile probably down here, um, so forth. But, you know, the liftoff and the subsequent buy and balance orders that hit was a tell for someone that you maybe not want to try and short the rip of this bar. Okay, you just count the times that Celsa, now was this a short squeeze? I mean, you know, it's really hard to tell. But the key thing is, is it's giving you hints really just giving you hopefully a, a perspective of what's going on in buy versus sell um, and keeping your powder dry for a potential. So as one of the previous presenters at Market Fest today um, showed us, we had movement and then a pullback to a certain level and then a potential move back up. So almost in profile terms, we had a little bit of a zipper, right? A zipper sort of rip, okay? By the way, a lot of times when you see this type of movement it is, um, has a lot of buy side um, imbalances in it. Um, you see a lot of really low volume. Those are what's called skipped prints. 
um, that's also can be a hint of other time frame activity as well. So we ripped up past that, spent some time balancing. Notice every time we came back down to, and you could see that the POC was pretty much right here. We lost all, nobody was basically getting short. You know, we rotated it down uh, two points and the volume just dried up, which was pretty easy to see. Also, we had three buy side imbalances. Now, even though we've moved up a bunch and, you know, it's hard to look at what we did the, the rest of the day because this is essentially 10 a.m. starting off this example. Probably would have been a pretty good place to put on along, right? Maybe not expecting to get a lot out of it, maybe a smaller type of trade. But the confidence of seeing that the 1696 area was almost like a little um, floor, if you will. You know, maybe it was a micro composite, you know, high volume node on the longer term time frame charts um, and so forth. But <clears throat> we pulled back, ripped again. I mean, there's examples galore that I have of this stuff, but it's a possible exhaustion print to zero. Okay. That doesn't mean we're going back down. No, but it's just a hint that maybe uh, volume may be drying up. So let me just take a quick look. 419, let me just jump right back in, bring the footprint back over. And let's see what took place today. So notice I'm scrolling all the way through what took place. Starting back off at the open here, 930, which is right here. So we came down into uh, the 2035 area, which has been a big floor uh, resistance point, bounce point, if you will, on a whole bunch of other areas, including market profile, lots of other confluence at that level. So the the notice that we had a buy side and bounce down there and a quick shot down into that area, um, if you were quick, would have been a good opportunity to get long. Now, as you were holding the trade, if you were going for something more than just a scalp, um, you can see how we're moving through, coming back up into an area. Notice here, we had an incomplete auction. See the 160 by 357 up here where my crosshairs is circling. So there's your hint that guess what? We may be coming back up to that area and boom, went right back up to that area and was hit with more than a four to one sell side bounce. Again, you gotta be kind of quick with this stuff. But if you got short here, you notice that hey, you got a few points out of it. I mean, it, it it, it certainly can seem like you'd want to do a lot of scalping on this, um, but ideally, if you were long off of that 35 or 36 area, knowing that the context of the market over the last number of days is that we've bounced hard off that area, I would have stayed long. I don't know that I would have taken pop shots and shorts six points away, okay? So again, see how context is superseding the minutia or the micro level of what's going on in the footprint here. So as we proceed forward, hopefully you're beginning to see what's taking place. One thing I will caution you with, don't pay as much attention to all of the noise inside these boxes. Just look at, it's almost like a speed reading through a, a paragraph. If you've learned how to speed read, you can pull certain points out of a paragraph and still have a general idea of what took place in your story. I suggest doing the same thing when it comes to the footprint. Just note what happens with any large volumes. In this case, you notice we are boxed in by a yellow box. This is the point of control. So this is a, <clears throat> this can be put in, in like yellow line form for somebody that may recognize that I've changed a few things around. I've also put in a, a delta divergence indicator down here at the bottom and I've tightened up my metrics data and I really only pay attention to the delta for the day and the delta. Um, the delta for the day is important because, you know, it's showing the net buy versus sell and, and then the blue here is a positive execution. At least the trend is at this particular point for a positive execution. You know, but as we go on further, I would imagine that the delta for the day probably got stronger as you can certainly see we're not up past 15,000 cars um, in the delta. So, Notice every time we rotate it back down, volume uh, points of control hit towards the bottom of these candles, and then we just move back up. Count the buy side imbalances. I mean, this is a ripper all day, right into 
a big area. Now, notice towards this area, which didn't cap us out for too long. Um, let me see if I can make this expand. Let's move down a little bit further. See the zero by 1058 after a big rip with one, two, five side imbalances to start off the run of this candle, uh, flanked by a whole bunch of volume at the top. See all these big black bracketed and yellow bracketed boxes is telling us that uh, we may have exhausted the run out. And there's a good chance that if we could spend some time under the 48 area, uh, we may see a more significant pullback. But <laughs> again, it, you know, you, you could almost just trade this today off of just looking at the footprint. Because look what happened every time we try to rotate back down. One, two, three, four buy side imbalances hit at the bottom of that range that was set by the liftoff at the 1059 candle. Okay. So remember, this is a five tick PNF reversal. So as soon as we ripped up into 2048.75 area, pulled back a little bit, did a five tick reverse, started forming a new candle. Um, so I, I like the PNS because it shows the power of a move, not just looking at time frame. I don't think you can glean as much as far as a micro uh, execution off of looking at these in, in, in minute-based or some tick-based um, periodicity. I just don't like that. So I prefer that it be in some sort of reversal so you can see the power of the move, which isn't always quite evident. <clears throat> and I'm not going to mess with the data. So the – see if there's anything else I can tell you. I'll take some questions. Now, I haven't spent a lot of time because I wasn't doing too much trading today. I was working more on client-based stuff for the RA side of the biz. But um, the – really haven't had too much. I figured I'd do this on the fly. So this is a pretty decent – notice coming into that 48, 49 area, rotation back down. Look what happened. Boom, volume dried up. And, again, mostly buy orders hit. This is that pullback of those slingshot trades. Um, they're quite powerful if one is how to utilize them in a trend day up. Okay, up here, incomplete auction, 54.50. I would think the price has a chance to maybe be magnetized back to that area at some point. That's the... The problem it's it's difficult to quantify that some point when is that going to be in a fast moving market it's usually pretty quick so as we come back up towards this area again um coming into the close of the day here 230 look at that see how the incomplete auction magnetized ties this back up towards the top again to get a complete auction with a sell side imbalance so my, my hope is Everyone, that you guys get at least a decent feeling for the power of the footprint. But as all trading is, is um, understand one other thing, guys. And and you know, Ashley, Dana, thank you guys for allowing me to present. This has been great. It's a it's a, it's a really cool. I, I typically am only a preferred educational partner for brokerage firms or software companies, um, as I was for Maris before they turned into Ninja. Um, but at the, this is the first sort of uh, investing portal um, slash festival event. Festival, we call it that. <laughs> festival event I've done, so thanks. Um, here's another example. So coming up on our time here, let's take some questions. I'll leave this screen up. Bear with me a second. I'll take a drink of water. I'm going to go through some questions. Susan, <clears throat> the... Footprint can be got at marketdelta.com. You're welcome, Michael. Yes, all these presentations will be recorded. You guys got any other questions? So 
So guys, am I actually that good? No questions? I guess, I guess maybe so. All right. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions or you want to take a look at the course, here's the course page. Got an email about this. So I'll just take a quick peek at this. To click on the education tab of our home page. We have 20% off on the course. It's actually pretty cheap. I recorded uh, four full weeks of 10 days of class and uploaded almost um, 40 plus hours of HD instruction on our Microsoft OneDrive cloud. It's pretty killer. I've had a lot of students go through this. The other thing I'm proud about you guys is not only did I qualify to become a Chase Payment Tech merchant, um, which is a difficult merchant system to, to get to use because I do not like PayPal nor will I ever use those idiots again. Um, the I've never ever had a charge back in a course ever in four years. So call me. I'm an old school guy if you want. Got any questions, anything? There's the email. If you want the slides, send me an email. I'm out. Thank you, Dan.